amazing friends. Thank you for coming. It's really indeed a privilege and a pleasure to stand here tonight to present the Physician of the Year Award to my dear colleague, Dr. Lewis Tepperman. I think pretty much everyone in the liver and transplant communities knows who Dr. Tepperman is, but for those of you who don't, he's the director of the organ transplant service at the New York University Langone Medical Center, a transplant service which he himself created after his arrival there in 1989, some 25 years ago. Those were the early days of liver transplantation, and doctors like Lou Tepperman were pioneers. Liver transplantation was, shall we say, invented, or at least developed in the late 70s and 80s as a modern life-saving uh, procedure by the famed uh, Dr. Thomas Starzl, who I understand is up for a Nobel Prize at last uh, this year. And Lou Tepperman was part of his first class of protégés that spread out around the country to establish beachheads for this new and exciting uh, surgery. Those who grew up with Lou during his childhood tell me you could tell early on he was a pioneer, and even you all can tell from this picture, as you might expect of any nine-year-old with a bow tie, he was a child prodigy who whizzed through school and graduated from Bronx High School of Science at the age of 15, shown with his mother and father, of course. But if I can let this very private audience uh, uh, this very private audience in on a, uh, on a very private secret that only some of us know. It was only his brain, it was not only his brain that catapulted him along the road to success. He had a secret weapon, Marjorie. Marjorie was Lou Tepman's mother, of course. Sadly, Mother Marjorie died two months ago at the age of 92. But we all know she and her spirit will always be with Lou and the liver transplant community forever and ever. After graduating from Mount Sinai Medical School, Lou went on to a surgery residency at Columbia Presbyterian and Long Island Jewish, and then made his critical career decision to study with famed Tom Starzl at Pittsburgh, the mecca of liver transplantation. We all know that Lou craves excitement and adventure, and some say he went into liver transplantation because he liked the idea of flying in small planes in the middle of the night. As, as liver transplant surgeons often do in the course of going out to obtain liver donations. <laughs> Others have said he went to surgery because we all know surgical suites are populated by scores of attractive women in very small and very smart blue jumpsuits. But those of us who really know him know he went into liver transplant surgery because he knew he could do a lot of good for a lot of very sick people. And when the operation is over, if you're still awake enough to remain standing, you can get a lot of hugs from a lot of wives and husbands and thankful children. And you can even help people at death's door recreate their lives as he did for this nice young woman, shown here with her baby born two years after her life-saving liver transplant. <laughs> On the other hand, maybe it was the plane trips after all. <laughs> Aside from being an outstanding transplant surgeon, Lou is also a great teacher, either on rounds with residents and house staff going over everything from how to examine and diagnose the patient to how to read their x-rays. But we all know that when you round with Lou, you better know your stuff and you better know your patients. The swamps of Kipps Bay are littered with the bodies of those residents who didn't manage their patients according to the exacting standard demanded by Dr. Tepperman. In addition to being a great teacher on a hospital level, Lou is also known nationally as one of the outstanding lecturers on liver transplantation and new and exciting developments in the field, many of which he himself pioneered. He was a major player in the development of living-related transplant techniques, a procedure which actually many of you in the audience know is one with which the husband can donate half his liver to the sick wife, or I know in some cases the wife can donate to the husband, as we know from some of our guests here, and they both wind up with normal-sized regenerated livers three months later. 
He wrote the definitive paper on transplanting hepatitis B patients without using repeated infusions of hyperunin globulin that ran up bills of 50,000 a year. And he was one of the first people to develop the use of kidney-saving mTOR inhibitors to transplant patients on immunosuppression. Currently, as those of us who work with him know, he is madly and hard at work on an artificial liver system for patients with acute liver failure. Lou is a really great transplant surgeon, a terrific t researcher and teacher. But those who know him know he is not s such a bad politician either. <laughs> and in between his surgeries and lectures, he manages to move up in the ranks of academic circles, where he is currently vice chairman of the NYU Department of Surgery, shown here with Professor Leon Pachter, our chief of surgery. And in between all this, he can play the role of Dr. Oz, though I depend on him much better than I would on Dr. Oz. He operates much more frequently. As shown here advising the world on XM Radio, Dr. Radio, along with our chief coordinator, Donna Campbell, on the, on the right. And in the next picture, along with our director of renal transplantation, Bruce Geld. But he has also starred on national broadcasting, and he even seems to find time to be a doctor to the stars, whether or not they need a liver transplant. <laughs> And I find it hard to believe that Catherine Zeta-Jones' liver was the basis of this association. <laughs> like all 21st century Renaissance men, lose interest range even further afield. How he manages to fit them all into a day amazes most of us around him. But he does. He's also a police surgeon. That's legit. I didn't make it up and a police commissioner associate. You see Kelly on the other side, looking to Lou for advice. And uh, he, not to mention a deep sea diver, uh, a cowboy. Anyone who knows him knows he is never without his cowboy boots. But fortunately for those of us in the department, he doesn't bring the horses to 34th Street very often. He's also a boatsman. And I think he's also a calf rover. Not to mention, he is the single most important leader of the Saudi Arabian army. <laughs> However, one of the very special characteristics of Lou Tepman is, is his devotion to his family. His obligations to and his love of his family are legendary. Here we have Lou with his son, uh, Jake, now a medical student at NYU. No comments about nepotism. But then uh, Jake was a bit, uh, no, don't get the wrong idea. He didn't get admitted to medical school at this age. Uh, I'm sorry, the person on the right is actually my wife, Wendy, but I couldn't resist putting this picture in. Okay. The other important uh, people in his life, of course, is his daughter, Carly, seen here with Jake at a later age. A very important uh, couple in their lives. And of course, I think we all know that the petite 98-pound gorilla in the Tepperman family is the quite beautiful and charming Helene Tepperman. And in between liver transplants, they hang out together. Actually, the family hangs out a lot, particularly in the Tepperman country house out on Long Island and uh, on the north shore of Long Island facing on the Long Island Sound. And, uh, overlooking the Long Island Sound in the North Fork. You can see the Tepperman family. Don't get the wrong idea, that's not his boat in the background. <laughs> his boat is more like a little rubber thing about 10 feet long. Uh, I don't want the New York Times to think he's getting overpaid for the transplants. Uh, I, and uh, this, this place has been the site of a wonderful family get-togethers, and we have our annual department party there. So I think we have here a man of many talents, many interests. Uh, but above all, uh, we have a man who is a gifted surgeon, who has devoted his life to saving other lives with the talents God gave him. And he further developed with a lot of hard work. Truly a physician of the year, but really a physician of the world for all times. Lou, where are you?
it's a, it's a pleasure to give this award on behalf of the American American, American Liver Foundation. Oh, maybe you can hock it. Okay. Uh, your constituency of family, patients, uh, and colleagues. Uh, that's our. That's the department that Lou oversees. Uh, it's a pleasure to give you this award on behalf of the American Liver Foundation, your constituency of family, patients, colleagues, and all of us who have worked as close, so closely with you over the years. You have more than earned it. Thank you, Doctor. So Hillel said unbelievably nice things about me. He's a very dear and warm friend, and I'm delighted to know him for my entire professional career. I know you're going to hear a lot of speeches, and if you'll just indulge me for a for short time, I promise you it won't take long. I'd like to look back at the field of transplantation for a little bit. When I went into medical school, my roommate, mother was very sick. She actually needed a liver transplant, and she died prior to it ever happening. This was not a successful procedure until later on. Dr. Starzl was working on it, and Hillel's right, he will receive the Nobel Prize this year, but he was persistent. Under the health care constraints today, I don't think he would have had a leg up. They would have laughed at him. First off, the length of stay of the operation was two months. Initial success rate was 25 percent, and it was a very, very expensive procedure. I've learned that expenses are relative if you can save a life, and a patient can go on to be productive, go back to work, be a parent, a grandparent, a husband, a wife. Isn't that giving back to society? Isn't that costing society less? Transplantation is the field that turns adversity into triumph, death into life. It is a field where innovation has to be applauded, and that's why Tom will get the Nobel Prize this year. When I started in transplant, there was this unnamed entity. Maybe you heard of it, non-A, non-B. In 1989, it finally got a name by Cho and Quo, Hepatitis C. But for the last quarter of a century, it has been the scourge of our existence. Watching patients die waiting for transplants, watching patients on a treatment that was useless and painful, and watching them die after transplantation with recurrent disease was disheartening. But once again, innovation stepped in. One of our sponsors of this event developed an expensive pill that the press says is expensive for hepatitis C treatment. Gilead is to be applauded. A disease has been identified and cured in approximately a quarter of a century. It's unheard of. Ten years from now, hepatitis C will barely be a thought. They have done the right thing and allowed cheaper generic medications to be made and given out in third world countries to treat hepatitis C. The countless money saved by not treating end-stage liver disease and the patients coming back to the hospital and the patients not needing a transplant makes up for what the press calls a thousand dollar day of pill. To use Visa or MasterCard's term, it's priceless. Patients in this room have been saved. They were going down for the count after a transplant because the disease came back and there's nothing to treat it. They are now leading productive lives, coming to events, and aiding and raising money to get awareness out and to treat other liver diseases. And that is the cornerstone, the mainstay of the mission of the American Liver Foundation. With the help of ALF, approximately more than three million people in the United States who have hepatitis C will be identified by screening efforts and treated. This will prevent liver cancer and end-stage liver disease. 
but don't worry, I'm not putting myself out of a job yet. End-stage liver disease will still exist for us. We have a huge problem with obesity and alcohol in this country. Drink up, the wine is very good. <laughs> to this end, you heard it, we've been researching another innovative strategy. And when I use this machine, people call us crazy. It's called the ELAD device, an extracorporeal liver assist device that uses human cells that have been immortalized. They live forever. Now, I don't know if it's going to work, but I can tell you that it's expensive, it's innovative, and it's controversial. But we need innovation. We need to go on with science to progress medicine. I believe all innovation has to be given to all patients equally, the rich, the poor, whatever race they are. And organs have to be given out equally. You may have read in the news recently that we are involved in the quote-unquote liver wars. There is a significant geographic disparity of how organs are allocated in the United States. We all know that New Yorkers have to be much sicker in order to get them. They have to have a higher severity score than people in Florida or Tennessee. Patients who are poor, who have Medicaid, or who have Obamacare, cannot transport their insurance. So they have to stay in New York, and the poor pay more. The sicker get sicker in New York. I call this the financial minority. Obamacare didn't fix this injustice, and in fact, it's broken, and it'll probably require a congressional act to fix it. And by the way, he made it more difficult for you guys to get here to the dinner tonight. I believe a life in New York is equal to a life in Arkansas or Minnesota. My, my daughter told me not to speak about Obama tonight. I honestly believe that life is sacred in any state in the Union. If, however, we fix the liver allocation, there still will be a critical organ shortage in the U.S. So what does the future hold for us? I believe there will be more innovation. Ready? In time, I believe that there will be 3D printers that can generate organs from stem cells. And finally, xenotransplantation, animals giving to humans, may be afforded a second look, though I'm sure the baboons aren't going to be too pleased about this idea. Liver transplantation has moved from an experimental to a therapeutic modality. I have been privileged in my lifetime to treat patients and see success right in front of me. I have been able to hawk my wares because of tremendous support. My home has been NYU after having been trained in Pittsburgh. Years ago, over a quarter of a century ago, NYU took a gamble and established the liver program and the Mary Lee Johnson Richards Organ Transplantation Center. Throughout the time at NYU, we've had institutional support by the NYU Langone Medical Center, the university, and support of important departments, such as Dr. Pachter, who runs our surgery department, hepatobiliary by Dr. Tobias, nursing, I saw Maureen here, and Donna, social work and research and countless other of colleagues. Not to mention, most important, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Gelb, Dr. Winnick, and Dr. John, who I've seen here, my colleagues. But no one has given more support to this program than my family. To my bride, Helene, who has always been there through the triumphs and occasional adversity, her support, love, and guidance and partnership had been unwavering. To my children, Jake and Carly, who have probably spent their formative years being awoken every night at 2 a.m. by an emergency phone call. In spite of that, Jake has gone on to medical school, and believe it or not, Carly is contemplating such a course. They are my greatest creation. 
No one would be prouder of my kids than my mom, who Dr. Tobias showed you, and my hat is off to you, Hillel. Because she supported all of us and believed in innovation, she was persistent. She believed in commitment, compassion, and above all else, passion. I thank each and every one of you for coming and granting me this high honor and supporting ALF. Thank you to the ALF, and Hillel, you are right. Thank you for the kosher franks and the blankets and the cocktail hour. My only requirement to be honored. I congratulate Rocco and Bob, two friends worthy honorees, who have committed countless years to ALF. And now I must follow the wisdom of Winston Churchill's two Bs. Be brief, which I hope I have done, and be seated. Thank you very much.